Thank you. Amen. Balesa Bachin Dikwe, which means to God be the glory. Amen? Yeah, it's been good. Balesa Baweme means God is good. And Bindi Shonse, all the time, right? Amen. Yeah, this has been a wonderful week. And again, uh, the testimonies that we've heard of how God got us there and how he's bringing us back, the testimonies heard about from my wife, Miss Tammy, um, getting there and uh, saying yes to the Lord and saying yes to me and, and saying yes to coming back. It's just, uh, it's been an amazing trip and we're still journeying on this. And, and uh, with uh, uh, Pastor Alex and his wife, that was wonderful last night, very humbling and uh, very, you know, we, um, the pastor has been talking about how he wants us to get involved, so not just to continue the work, yes, obviously, to overall continue the work. We're not abandoning Kafula Futa, we're not abandoning MIM, GCMS, this is a work that's going to continue. But uh, he's been talking about us giving financially, as we ought, um, to give a shot in the arm. You know, Pastor Pule, Andrew Malenga, Alex Chippy, and the other nationals, you know, and, and I think that's wonderful. Um, at the same time, I think we needed something. And uh, last night, I think we got a shot in the arm. Amen. It was a wonderful message. Thank you, Pastor. It was very encouraging. And, and so, uh, but I'm so thankful for what God is doing. And, uh, you know, one thing I didn't share uh, last night was uh, at the testimony, whenever I gave um, our testimony, was, you know, it was interesting in how God was working things through. And it wasn't until... I was actually sitting down with Pastor Alex and Pastor Pule and Pastor Andrew telling them that God was bringing us back, which is a very difficult conversation to have. But I, I just realized in that moment, and again, also, we also understand that God moves as he sees fit, right? But I also understood in that moment that, and when I use this word replace, I don't mean replace, replace, right? I'm, I'm going to use the word, but I don't mean that on for good. I just, I'm using it to explain the situation. That at time I thought that God was using, you know, uh, Pastor Pule is going to replace us over there. And, and uh, God showed, a, showed me that it wasn't. He's an addition. He's, he's an addition to the ministry. And, and again, replace is probably a difficult word to use. But one thing that God showed me was that God was just changing out. He was shifting See, God's in, and in, in, that's what, he's a God of shifting. He likes to shift people around. And after we got there, um, as time went on, God saw fit to move some pieces around. He, um, he moved, actually, Pastor Andrew Malenga out from being the dean of the institute there and brought in Pastor Alex. There came a time where God saw fit it was time to shift Lorna from this earth to glory. It was time to shift. After that happened, God shifted and moved, and the reason I use shifted is because that's how they say move in Zambia, and I think it's a lot cooler than the word move, you know. But he, he shifted John, Sarah, off the mission and down to his, the house that him and Lorna had built. So there was a lot of movement in the past four years, a lot of shifting taking place. And as we know, um, God called John home just this year. Uh, he shifted him home. And, and I don't know if you also know, but in 2018, God shifted Eve Jarvis from here to glory, another missionary in Zambia, and just recently another missionary, her husband, Dick Jarvis, has been shifted home to glory. So God did a lot of moving around, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because God, I, he, was, he showed me that it was time to shift back to the States, but the overall replacement, if I can use that word, was God was just shifting us out and shifting Pastor Alex and and his wife, Crystal, in. And, 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 and the vision that God had laid upon my heart is going to continue. It's not my vision, it's God's vision. But it was so wonderful because God has really knit this man and my heart together. I mean, there are times where we're just sitting there and, and I'll say something. He's like, oh, I was just thinking the same thing. And, and then the same thing happened. He's thinking of something and he tells me and I'm like, I just thought of that, you know, like yesterday. So God have us go in the same direction. And one thing that God started showing me was that I shared with you that what was on my heart was planning pastor training centers, you know, youth ministry. I told you that we were going to turn the older ministry over to Pule, then I was going to come back. And 
city and, and work through the youth and work through pa- um, planting churches into the cities. And after sitting down with this man and getting to know his heart, that's exactly what his heart was. And so I'm just sharing this with you because it's not that he's taking us out. is He's just rotating some of his children. That's all he's doing. And that's what God's in the business of. He's shifting around. And, and we have to embrace what God is doing no matter how difficult it is. We've got to embrace it as long as we understand it's his vision and not ours. So I'm, please continue to pray for them because they're going to be here for the next three months. You know, one thing, I, I think that this is wonderful for you guys because all the times that missionaries have gone from the United States over to Africa, we've gone in, but none of the nationals, hardly none of the nationals know what the missionaries go through. No, they just don't know by experience. They can visualize it, but they can't experience it. Well, now Pastor Alex knows He knows exactly what his wife had to step through in order to move over there. He knows exactly what it's like for every missionary to come over and come out of their comfort zone into a culture that we have no idea. And now he knows. He knows exactly. So now when they're here, please pray for them because he's still adjusting as normal as he will. But soon in about three months, they're going to go back. But I guarantee you, they're going to go back stronger than they were when they came. They're going to go back with their mindset more on the mission because now they understand one another equally when it comes to culture and investment and adjustment. So please pray for them as they're here for the next three months, and please pray for their unity and growth, and, and, uh, and I'm going to be praying for you guys. I love you guys very much. And, uh, and also, please pray for us, um, as the pastor said, um, on Monday, I'm going back to Zambia, and I'm going to be there for about three months. I'm planning on coming back mid, mid-January. Uh, I'm going to put on many hats when I get over there because uh, there's much to get done in order to make this transition and make it happen, right? Um, but as Tammy and Titus are staying back this time, kind of give you an idea of what we're doing and our shifting back here. Um, what we're looking at doing is I'm going to go over, I'll come back mid-January, and then we're praying about possibly sometime next year, June or July, for us to go back as a family to be able to, uh, you know, uh, get some closure on some things with some friends and uh, to figure out exactly how and what we can bring back with us so we can shift back over here. So please pray for us as we're in this transition. Amen? So um, as we continue... Obviously, you guys know if you've been listening to the messages, we're going to be talking about some more bookends tonight, amen? And uh, tonight's uh, bookend is called um, Bookends of God's Assignment. Book- it's an uncommon intimacy. Remember, bookends is what holds that up in the middle. And uh, we know that what's going to be held up, and by the end of the message, I hope and pray you understand that what's going to be held up in your life through these bookends is going to be the intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, the bookends of righteousness, the bookends of a crucified life, they all, there's things that hold these up in order for us to accomplish what God has called us to do. Amen? And we need God to hold these up in our lives. And so my prayer for our church tonight, our family, is that this wouldn't just be another conference that we listen and then we put it up on a shelf when we go about our business. Because there's some true business that God wants us to take place here in Blue Springs. There's things that have to be taken care of here. There's, there's the work of God that has to be taken care of around this world. And uh, my prayer for you is that you all see your assignments and what God's going to be assigning us as a church, as believers, as individuals. Because we have to fulfill it. Amen? So Proverbs 20, verse 6, most men proclaim everyone his own goodness but a faithful man who can find. We've, we've talked about much that this faithfulness is always found in the standard of Jesus Christ. There's no other way that we can ever measure ourselves but to Jesus Christ. We have to fulfill this standard. And if we don't, if we don't try and, and trust God to help us, then we're going to fail in the assignments that he gives us. Just as we've been given an assignment, we've all been given some assignments, right? And we're going to take a look at the different assignments tonight that we had in Christ's life and in the church and as believers uh, and as individuals. And, and one thing about assignments, when you're given an assignment, you're given an assignment 
with the intention that they're going to be fulfilled, right? I mean, think about students. You students who are out there, when you go to school and the teacher gives you an assignment, what do they expect? They expect that you bring it on time and it's filled out and complete. And you know, I know you all know what happens. I know, I know. What happens if you don't get it turned in, right? You might lose a letter grade, GPA might come down, you know, whatever might happen. But the teacher expects it to be fulfilled. There's no other way in their mind. We have to understand that with the assignments that God has given us, God's no different. He accepts, uh, expects us to fulfill every assignment that he has given. And let me tell you, Jesus Christ, he's our standard. Every assignment that God the Father gave him, he fulfilled 100% without fault. He never got a mark. And you know what? One of his final assignments was the cross. He was there on time. He got it there on time. He got to the cross on time, and he died on time. I remember uh, Pastor Betson in, 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 in Zambia. He would say, we're starting church on time. Jesus was not late to the cross. We will not be late to service, you know? And I'm like, praise God, amen. That's the way, we, we, it's on time. Jesus was on time, amen. So assignments are always given with the intention that they will be fulfilled. So what are God's, what was Jesus Christ's assignments? And we're going to go down here, just a list of some things. That was Jesus Christ's assignment. His ultimate assignment was to fulfill the will of the Father. Everything else falls under that. John 6, 38, for I came not down from heaven... Not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. If that was the assignment given to Jesus Christ and he fulfilled it 100%, that should be our willingness to fulfill the will of God in our life. It w another one was to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came to save sinners. That was one of his assignments. John 18, 37, he came to bear witness of the truth. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now try to remember that. Try to remember that when he says, everyone, here let me read it again, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice, because we're going to be talking a lot about the voice of God tonight. Some other assignments that he had. To destroy the devil and his works, Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And I, put, and I, I think I have it there. Yes, you see how I have it underlined had. I like that. The reason I underlined it is because it's past tense. He has no more power anymore. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he, just, he took that power away from the adversary. And he's the one with power. He rose from the grave on the third day with the power. Amen? He destroyed death. Praise the Lord. Another one is to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This was an assignment. Also to reveal God's glory. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. These were some of Jesus Christ's assignments, just some of them. And there's much more. I'm going to give you a list of some others. He came to bring light to a darkened world, to give eternal life, to receive worship, to bring joy, to demonstrate humility, to preach the gospel to preach judgment, to fulfill the law of the prophets, to reveal God's love for sinners. He came to die. He came to bring peace. He came to bring the sword, to bind up the broken hearts, and to satisfy our deepest thirsts. And it goes on and on and on and on. You guys remember the other night we talked about Josiah. What did he do? Remember the list that we gave? Those were the assignments that God had given him. And he fulfilled them. Jesus Christ fulfilled them without mark. He fulfilled all of them. So church, let me ask you. What's, we're going to go down through the church's assignment, the believer's assignment. What are some of the church's assignment? We don't have to stay here real long because we know most of these. But my prayer is, is as we're going over these, ask yourself, 
where am I at within these assignments of the church? God's assignment for the church, there's five primary goals. The first one's evangelism. We understand that. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore. See, that's what our church is about. It's about going, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone shared it with you. Are we sharing it with others? And I say that to myself with deep conviction. See, that's what we're supposed to do. As a whole church, how are we doing this? The second one is making disciples. In Matthew 28, 19, teaching all nations. Not only are we supposed to bring the hope, but we're also supposed to bring the perfection. When someone comes to know Jesus as your Savior, we bring them along and we are called to perfect them. That was, I, I've shared with before in the past, that's our mission, was to bring hope to the lost and perfection to the saints by bringing glory to God. Amen? That's the second piece. Third is conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. We've talked about this many times. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Well, who was it that he did foreknow? Did he pick out Brian Calloway and, and allow somebody else to go to hell? Because that's what some people teach. That God chooses that some goes to hell and that God chooses that some goes to heaven. See, that's not the God we serve. That's not the God of the Bible. See, when the Bible says that Jesus Christ was, when he was slain before the foundations of the earth, he died for someone, yes. But who he died for was the church. It's that simple. He died for the church. Through foreknowledge, God the Father knew what was going to happen. So before the foundations of the earth, Jesus Christ was slain as the, the Lamb of God, right? So it's this simple. When, you, when he said, to whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, the, of Christ, of his son. Who was it? It was the church. So it's as simple as this, church. You choose God, he chooses you. You choose God, you enter in to the body of Christ, and immediately God's vision for your life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what the, one of the primary goals of the church is. Establishment of churches. When you look at Acts 16.9 and Titus 1.5, there's so many other verses. Acts 16.9 is the Macedonian call, right? Whenever, when, when he hears, come help us, and Paul the apostle goes, and then he goes into Philippi, and he starts sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and starts planting churches. In Titus 1.5, he says, you know, I left thee in Crete that you might ordain elders. See, this is the purpose of the church is to reproduce itself as a whole. If the world's going to be changed, it's going to be changed through God's local New Testament church. That's the way he's planned it always. So if we're not reproducing ourselves, we're failing some of the primary goals that God has given us. And then the last one, bringing glory to God. Whether you drink, eat, whatsoever you do, do all the glory of God. That means if you're sitting here singing, that means if you're with your neighbors or you're at work, whatever we do, we're supposed to be bringing glory to God. And we talked this week so much already about crucifying the flesh and crucifying the world to yourself and you to the world. Because if there's any part of the flesh or this world that you're focusing on, it's impossible to give God glory. How are we doing, church, as a whole? How's First Bible Baptist doing when it comes to fulfilling these primary goals? See, these, this is the assignment. How do you venture in this? as members of First Bible, as not just members of First Bible, but also as the body of Christ as a whole. See, this is the assignment we've been given. But then there's also God's assignment for believers. God's assignment for believers, this is called progressive sanctification. This is growing in the grace and the knowledge of God, right? And I know there's different ways to break it down, and I'm sure you've heard from teaching here, listener, learner, leader, lever. But I heard it another way through through uh, Lee Tiller a while back, and I thought it was really neat, and we took it and started teaching it over in Zambia through our discipleship, um, the discipleship courses that we had had when we brought discipleship over and actually just reinstituted it. It was already there. But here in Mark 4, 9, it says, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We talked about that, what the pastor said. We need to hear what God wants us to hear, not what we want to hear. So he who hath ears to hear, are you listening? Do you hear? See, when, when you're a listener and you come in, you know what happens? I remember when I got saved, I was full of so much passion. And you know what that passion produced in my life? It produced preservation. Passion produces preservation. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I guarantee you, I've heard before men 
say, I can't remember, the, I, can't, I, cannot, I can't memorize the Bible. I can't memorize it. It's too difficult. It's, it's here. And even I struggle with it at times, right? I have a bad memory. That's one thing I was known for in Zambia. If I left the mission, they're like, oh, he'll be back in about two minutes because he probably forgot something. And I did. I was always driving back, right? And they knew it. But here's the thing, though. But many of you say you can't memorize Scripture, but for a lot of you guys, you can tell me every Chiefs player, every number, all their stats. <laughs> Baseball players, you can tell me their stats. And it, See, it's passion that brings about preservation. And if you have a desire to know God and the power of his resurrection, you will have passion. You invest to what's important to you. That's what you're going to do, right? So as a listener, it's almost like the, 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 the leader says, okay, now here's this. I'm going to do, you're going to watch. I'm going to do, and I want you to watch me. And you can see this throughout the life of Jesus Christ and his disciples. And in John chapter 11, this is just one example. This is when Lazarus is getting, has died. And this is what he says. I says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. He's telling his disciples, for your sakes, I am glad that I was not there when he died. Why? This is what he says. He says, to the intent that you may believe. See, if I was there, you may not believe, but I allowed him to die so that way I can go and raise him so that you can believe. You see, I'm going to do it. I want you to watch. And see, that's where we need to be. We have to have, as a believer, you, it always starts here as a listener. Are you hearing God's word? Are you listening to his voice? Are you allowing him to create passion in your life? Because I promise you, if you have passion, you will have preservation. It won't go. And then you move to the next step, which is a learner. I do, you help. So as a leader takes this person, this disciple alongside and says, now I'm going to do, but I want you to help me. You know, this is when discipleship has already started and it's starting to take place, right? That's like if you, have, if you have someone new who wants to get out there on ADP sports and they're not quite sure what to do and you take them alongside because you're a veteran, you've been out there for years and you say, you know what, I'm going to bring you alongside me and I'm going to do it. I just want you to help me. You've already watched me, but now I want your help. Show me, show me here, what, am I, what are we supposed to do next, you see? That right there is a learner. And in Matthew chapter 14, 13 to 21, this is the feeding of the 5,000. If you think about it, remember Jesus did, and they helped. He blessed the fishes. He blessed the loaves. Then he gave it to them and said, now go feed the people. You see? He's getting them involved. He's preparing them for something bigger down the road, and they don't even realize it yet. And then you move to the next step as a leader, and you start growing. Now, there's many steps in between these four, right? But as a leader, you start growing, and, and no longer are you being discipled directly by somebody. You're always going to have a Paul in front of you, right, that you're looking to for direction and guidance. But now it's time for you to lead. And you might have that leader that's next to you there, and now he's saying, okay, now you do, but I'm going to help you. I want you to get out. I want you to get your hands dirty. I want you to take this team up there. I want you to do it, and I'm going to be right by here just to help you, encourage you, love on you, and help you take that next step. And that can be a fearful step at times. But it's time. You do, and I'm going to help. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, plus also in Luke 10, Jesus Christ sends out the 12. He sends out the 70. And he's going, now it's time for you to do it. But I'm going to help you by empowering you with what you need in order to accomplish the task that I've given you. And I'm going to equip you with what you need. I'm going to give you everything that you need. He, gave him, he sent him out to preach the gospel, and he sent him out to heal, right? He says, you do it, and I'm going to help. So this is the assignment for the believer. And then, next step, lever. Now, don't just block me off here. Oh, if I do this, oh no, you know. God's, I'm not, a lever doesn't always mean going halfway around the world or around the world. Yes, it could be. But see, what's happening is God, you're at a place right now of world consecration where really you might be reevaluating your life and what's important. You might be reevaluating your life and saying, wow, am I going to serve the world or this? And you finally take that step where you're like, I'm all in, God. I'm all yours now. And then that's when it comes down to the place where you do, I watch. See, in Acts chapter 1, we know that, Acts 1.8. When, when, and that's our verse, that's our, the name of this uh, conference here, Acts 1.8. 
that we are to be witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts, right? And that's when he gives them the commission to go out. I'm going to send you out. And then what happens? Jesus Christ ascends and he sits on the right hand of the Father. See, now it's time for them to get after it. Now it's time for them to go and to do what God has called them. And I hope you kind of connect this because what the pastor said last night goes right along with this here. See, it's a, there's a price of discipleship. Amen? There's a price. It's going to cost you something. But like he said, unfortunately, a lot of the times, people want the results without the process. But this is the process that God has placed for you and me. This is it right here. And so the reason I'm sharing this with you is because, yes, we have an assignment as a church, but, yes, we have assignment as believers. This is what God expects from us as believers. Where are you at, church? Where are you at in the process? Are you fulfilling the assignments that God's given us? But then it takes us to the next one. And the next one is this, God's personal assignment for the individual. There's a verse in... Um, Colossians 4, 17, Paul the Apostle calls a man out. And he says, And I say unto Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. He calls him out. I don't know exactly why. Maybe he got tired. Maybe he got weary. Maybe he was giving up. But he was getting ready to, to give up or stop doing what God has called him to do. God gave this man a specific, personal, individual assignment. And Paul had to remind him, don't give up. Don't give up. Within the assignments of the church and our responsibilities as believers, we find our personal assignments. Here's the thing, though. They're not laid out in Scripture like the rest of this is. There's no verse that I can go to that says, Brian, you're supposed to move away from Zambia. Brian, you're supposed to go here. You know, there's no book in the Bible that's written specifically for me. But let me tell you, all the assignments for all of us are there. You just have to dig. You have to get in and you got to seek God's face and allow him through the spirit of God to reveal those to you. We all have personal assignments. And let me tell you something. God expects them to all be fulfilled. And you know, our pastor has been talking about tests, that there's assignments given. You know what? There's going to be a test at the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to have to face him and let him know. And he's going to, we don't even have to let him know. He already knows. He's going to tell us either pass or fail. Or you did weak in this area. You did strong in this area. But God has got a specific assignment for all of us. And the thing is, is you've got to be faithful in that. That uncommon faithfulness that we've been talking about. But you have to go after it. You have to have that passion of preservation. Are you going to fulfill what God is? It's like, for example, your wife, your spouse. Um, your work, whatever these assignments God, maybe it is the mission field, maybe it's working over here at the butterflies or over here, in the, all those, if you have question, all of them are found in scripture. They're found with God's counseling. But we have to get in and we have to dive in deep. Whether we're supposed to move, whether we're supposed to stay, I mean, there's nothing specifically that tells us, but there is. And it all depends upon whether you're seeking God's face or not. So what did it take for Jesus to fulfill his assignment? What did it take for the church to fulfill its assignment? What does it take for the believer to fulfill our assignment? And what does it take for me to fulfill my assignment? What's it take for you to fulfill your personal assignment? And I think it really comes down to this. It comes down to an uncommon intimacy. That's what it comes down to. If you don't have a true, deep intimate, passionate walk with God, it's going to be difficult to find out even what your assignment is. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him, and I will sup with him and he with me. See, that's the invitation. That's, that's what God is, he's just saying, I'm, I, I'm right here. That's the intimacy that he's talking about. And here's what, here's what he's trying to say. God has already given you an invitation to salvation. Now he's waiting for your invitation to intimacy. 
He's standing at the door. He's just, he's already given you that invitation. He's talking to the church as if you've already said yes to him. That makes you a child of God if you know Jesus as your Savior. Now you're standing, he's standing outside the door. Some of you have opened, he came in, he's walking around your house, you've invited him to sit down, and all things good. Praise God, keep him in your house. But some of you are keeping him outside the door. I will come in unto him. I will sup with him and he with me. Wow. It's your time to invite him to a place of intimacy. If you don't have a desire to invite him in, he will always remain on the outside. He's always going to be out there trying to get in. A passion. Do you have a passion? That passion that preserves. I promise you he won't let you down. I promise you whatever assignment that it is he has for you, it will be worth having. It will be worth fulfilling. So what does it come down to when it comes to the intimacy of God? Well, I think it comes down to this. It comes down to the voice of the Lord. It says this here, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, do you hear my voice is what he's saying. If you hear my voice. And again, that word, if, if, that's a choice. We've talking about that this week. That's a choice. You've got to choose to hear God. But unfortunately... Some may hear the voice, but his voice isn't different from many more voices that are screaming at you on a daily basis. You don't know the difference between his voice and the voice of the world. And that can become a problem. Now, these verses are not up here. But Psalm 65, 7, it says this, talking about God. Now, listen. Which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of the ways, the tumult of the people, that word tumult means uproar. You know, when I've been down in Zambia, and many of you have been down there before, when you go to, uh, when you go to um, Victoria Falls, and if you're down there about June or July, the water's rushing so loud and hitting so loud, you can't hear somebody standing next to you. There's a bridge that we walk across, and certain times of the year, the water's crashing so hard, the mist is coming up, you have to rent a poncho, a, 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 a wet what, um, a raincoat to walk across because you get drenched. But it's so loud, you can't hear the person next to you. See, that's what the world is to us right now. The world is loud. It's got many voices. It's like many waters just raging and uproaring in our life. And we're listening to that rather than listening to the voice of God. What are some of those noises? Politics, huh? That's one. Religion. You know, people saying, no, you got to work your way to God. You see, that's religion. That's not biblical truth. How about unsupporting family? That can be a noise in our life. Peer pressure for many, young and old. Drugs and alcohol, that was a voice of mine that I struggled with. It used to call out and cry to me quite a bit. Personal ambitions. We have a lot of personal ambitions. Everybody telling us that if you don't do this, if you don't go to college, if you don't do this, then you're never going to make it in life. You're never going to succeed. That can become very loud in our ears. Greed, fame, anger, revenge. These can all be voices. But I love it because in Psalm 29.3 it says this, The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. When you think about Jesus in Luke 8, 22 through 25, he was down in the boat sleeping and the, the storms were raging. And, 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 the, and, and his disciples came, don't you care about us? I mean, come on, of course he did. But he gets up and with his voice, there was calm. See, those voices can be raging in our life. But are we listening to the voice of God? And if you're not spending time with him and spending time with that intimacy, you may not know the difference. See, there's many different types of voices. There are different voices that are in the Bible. One, and uh, we won't stay on these real long, but there's the voice of signs. Exodus 4.8 says, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter. See, this was back during Moses and the, and the, and the plagues. And each one was a, a sign, but it was a voice. It said something. It was crying out. It was speaking. See, this voice here was directed straight to the Jews and not to the church today. Jews were always looking for a sign. So this is something we can learn, but this is not the way our God speaks to us now. How about the voice of God's creation? 
Psalm 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. I mean, some, I look forward to this sometimes. I know uh, Tammy, and I can't say that Tammy and Crystal look forward to this, but she mentioned load shedding because there's not enough power for the country, right? Well, there were times when the power would go out at night, and I would step outside, and I'd turn my light off, and there's no moon, there's no clouds, and it was just black, pitch black, and I could just see the Milky Way. It was God's glory just crying out to me. It was amazing. And there's no place around the world that does not hear this voice. The voice is for all and can be seen around the world. But here's the thing, this type of voice, this is for God's glory, but it's not for our direction. God's not going to give us direction in life and, oh, I had a bad day today and, oh, the world is coming down and it's blue and, there, and all of a sudden you see a, pl a flower. Oh, that's a sign God is directing me. Now I've got to sell my house and do this. God doesn't speak through, through his creation like that. God speaks through his creation in a way that just portrays his glory. But that's the voice. Enjoy it. Go out and look at it. We were talking about moments and conversations tonight, Pastor. How many times do we just let moments pass by to never have again? See, this is one of those. But then there's also a voice of the Lord. This is the voice for everyone, but how it shows up now is different than the way it used to show up. You know, I never knew this, but I looked up this phrase, and this phrase, voice of the Lord, only shows up once in the New Testament, just one time. And it's over in Acts chapter 7, verse 31. But when it mentions it, it's pointing us back to the Old Testament. It's pointing us back to Moses at the burning bush. You see, the voice of the Lord, the reason why it's not here right now, this type of voice of the Lord, is because God has chosen to speak to us differently. How has he chosen? Go with me over to Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, God gives us a glimpse on how he talks to us today. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, God, who in sundry times and divers manners spake in time to pass unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who he have appointed heir upon all, of all things, by whom also he made the world, worlds. It says right here, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. Well, the last I checked, Jesus Christ, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And the Word was manifest in the flesh. He speaks to us through this Scripture, through the authority of the Scripture that God has given us. Amen? This is how He speaks to us now. This is how He talks to us. This is what He shares with us. See, Jesus Christ, He knew. He knew the, the voice of His Father, why? Because he spent time with them. There were times he went out and he prayed in the morning, he prayed at night, he prayed in the evening, all night long. He prayed alone and he prayed with others. He, he made sure to have intimate time with his Lord, and in doing so, he knew his voice. Jesus didn't have the word as we have it because he was the word. And now we have the word in written form. We have the mind of Christ. So if we're going to anything else other than this, then we're going to be led astray by the voices that we talked about the other day, right? By those who are creeping in unawares trying to lead us in the wrong direction. This gives us the direction and guidance and the voice that we need to hear. The only way you're going to do this is by spending time with him, this uncommon intimacy. God's voice for your personal life will always line up. Now listen, it's always going to line up with the assignment of the church. It's always going to line up with the assignment of the believer. Whatever your individual assignment that God gives you, it will never be outside the boundaries of Scripture or the assignment that God has given to us as a local New Testament church. If you find yourself outside of there, it's not God's assignment. I remember years ago hearing a testimony where um, a pastor was talking to this man, and the man says, yeah, I feel like God is leading me out here to uh, this other state. And with wisdom, the pastor said, well, what's God's plan for your life? And they went through a lot of this, and he got him to realize, yes, that I'm to grow in Christ and be conformed to the image of Christ, and that it's through the local New Testament church. And he says, now where you're going 
does it have a local New Testament Bible teaching and preaching church? And he said, no. He said, then when, why would God lead you to a place where you can't grow, where you can't get to know him? You see, the job looked so good. It looked so promising. He, had, he was going to make more money. He was going to have maybe more time with his family. But yet he would have gone someplace where he would have been outside the boundaries of Scripture. See, that's wisdom. See, God's not going to lead you to a place like that. It's always going to be within the assignment of the church. And it will never be for self-gain, but it's always going to be for God's glory. It will never be for self-gain. So when it comes down to this, his scripture gives us the confirmation that we need, but he gives the confirmation through his word because everything we find is in the word of God. So his confirmation is going to be found in scripture. His we're going to see it through the Spirit of God. We're going to have confirmation and peace that the Spirit of God gives us. And it's also this confirmation, the voice is going to come through the church. Confirmation through the body of Christ. Confirmation through leadership. I told my, my wife I was going to share this as an example tonight, but I think it fits, right? So there was a time, and I'm going to use an old word here, or, or a word you don't hear very often, that the courting. I was courting my wife. Amen. And uh, I had to get a stick. I had to beat her off a little bit with a stick and have her move. I'm, I'm just kidding. But courting, I was courting her. And I remember about, and, and some of you guys that were around might remember this. But uh, there came a time when I was in Lowry City. And I'm sitting here reading scripture. If you have your Bibles, go to Psalm chapter 34. Because I want to read this to you. In Psalm 34. I was sitting in Lowry City at a gas station waiting to pick up my daughters. And as I was reading scripture, see, this there was a time I started, I, I really, I, Tammy and I went on a mission trip together to El Salvador. Um, there wasn't any connection down there at all. I remember uh, 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 handing out tracts and sharing the word of God together with her. But when I got back, God started really working on my heart. And, and started kind of giving me eyes and directing me towards her. And I, I went through some struggles with that, right? But I never felt at peace of talking to her at all until this night. I was in Lowry City getting ready to pick up my daughters. And, and I remember reading Psalm 34, 1 through 4. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And I remember the moment... I, I can just picture it like yesterday when I read it and it hit me, that passion. I mean, I was just like, this is it. God's given me the green light. I get to go talk to her, right? But here's the thing. I was so excited. As soon as I got my daughters, I drove straight over to Steve Lighty's house. Because, see, the Spirit led me through Scripture, gave me peace about it. But then I went to my discipler and I opened up Scripture, Steve Lighty, and I said, this is what God is showing me. And you know what? The humble heard, and they were glad. And then I went to Paul Wolf, and I sat him down, and I said, Paul, I believe this is what God's doing in my life. And I read him these verses. And just like it said, the humble heard, heard and he was glad. He said, you know what? I think she's going to make a, a great help meet for you. And so it was about that time when finally I mustered up the, the courage. And I asked, I said, I need to come over and talk to you about something. I had no clue how she felt about me at all. But I said, you know what, this is what God is doing. So I opened up, I opened up scripture, and I, and I sat her down, and I said, look, I, I really like, I like you a lot, is what I said. <laughs> I like you. No, I did say, I like, you know, as God has moved you on my heart, and I, I, I really feel like there's something there. And as I was reading scripture, God gave me confirmation to come talk to you. And you know what, praise the Lord, she didn't run me out of the house. She said, you know what, I feel the same way. I had no idea. I was 100% faith. And then you know what I did? <laughs> On a little sticky note, I wrote, I like you. Do you like me? Circle yes or no. And I handed it to her. <laughs> and you know what? And she's still with me, you know? Amen. I mean, she didn't run. Praise God. But you know what? Here's the thing. The reason I'm sharing this is because... All of these confirmations came directly as God said they would. There was scripture, the leading of the spirit. There was the body of Christ, my, my disciples. There was the leadership that actually saw all this happening and said, yes, 
And you know, the beautiful thing is whenever we got married, this is what happened. Look at this. In Proverbs 24, 6, it says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make war. The moment that her and I got married, we became one, fighting in a spiritual battle together. We have extolled one another. We had praised his name together. We've gone through fires and battles together. But look at the second half. And in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Our counselors was found in Scripture. Our counsel was found in the Spirit of God. Our counsel was found in the body of Christ. Our counsel was found in leadership. You see, what I'm trying to say is anything God will have you to do, it will always be found in Scripture. His assignment will never be outside of the assignment of the church or the assignment of the believers. God is giving you the wise counsel. This is where we need to be going at all for every decision that God may give you. The voice of the wise counsel will always line up with the assignment of the church and the plan of God. Amen? And I hope and pray tonight that whatever assignment it is that God has for you, that you're going to seek out that wise counsel. Because we are in a battle. We are in a war. This isn't a game, but we're pretending like it's a game. There are souls at stake. There are people, as I spoke for the past almost hour, there are people that's died and gone to hell. We as a church have a responsibility. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all people, especially the household of the faith. Amen? We're going to find that counsel within the church. We're going to find that counsel within. But we have to know his voice. If you don't know his voice, you won't know what assignment you're supposed to take. But quickly, as, as my pastor would say, quickly, quickly. Amen? Quickly, quickly. We have one more to look at. You have to have a willingness to open the door. You can hear the voice all you want. You can, you can listen to through the door. You can get a glass and put it to the door if you'd like. But if you don't open the door, it's not going to matter. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, you have to open the door. you got to get up off the couch. You can't be afraid to open. Intimacy cannot even begin if you do not open the door. The Lord's inviting you to a place of unity, a union between you and him. That's what he wants. He's about unity. He's about a union. Before you can have unity with the body, you have to have unity with him. Before you can have unity within your community, you have to have unity and union with the Savior first. If you don't do it in that order, everything you do after that point will be done in vain. It's got to be for Jesus and him alone. It all begins at Jesus. You've got to open the door. God's voice compels you, but you must take action. You must get up. And some of you might be fearful of what God may ask you. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. But, but what if God asked me to go to Zambia? What if God asked me to go talk to my neighbor, which I can't stand? Well, he probably can't stand you either, right? But what if he does ask you to, to, to mend a fence or, 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 or to, to, to make things right between something that's a, a relationship that's been broken? That's okay. Because you know what? He's going to give you power of victory to do so. God will give you the love that's going to walk you through and sustain you through these trials. He's going to give you a sound mind through scripture, through the counsel in order to make the correct decisions. Because why? God is not an author of confusion. He's not going to bring anything into you that's going to confuse you. It's always going to be straight and narrow. He's going to, he's going to make the crooked road straight and he's going to help you through whatever it is he asked you. I had no clue God was going to ask me to go to Zambia. But you know what? I had already chosen to say yes before he asked. Why? Because I had an intimate walk with him. My intimacy with him was already deep. And you know what? To this point, it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Man, there's no place like to be than in, in an intim in intimate walk, intimate time with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's like, well, how do you know when you hear the voice if you ask that? It's probably you've never heard his voice. Or if he has, there's too many other voices keeping it where you can't hear him. God is not the author of confusion. There are no excuses, church. We have laid out to you tonight the assignments. The assignments of the church, the assignments of the believer. We've even, we even seen the assignments of Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled each and every one of them. You are promised he will give you what you need. 
It takes unity with God. It takes unity with this church in order to know what you're supposed to do. It's an uncommon intimacy. Amen? And that takes us down to our, our bookends, you know? You got to hear him. The more you hear him, the quicker you're going to recognize his voice. But then you've got to muster up the strength to open the door. Both of these will mean that if you do this, he will give you a guaranteed assignment through that intimacy. Some of you want the assignment, some of you don't, but I promise you that if you just open the door, if you just listen to him, his desire will become your desire. Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself. Become moldable and shapeable in his hands. If you just allow yourself to be moldable in his hands, his desire will become your desire. Bookends of God's assignment. We saw on Sunday morning, bookends of the word of God and the heart of conviction that holds up uncommon integrity. We saw on Monday, the walk of God and the heart of a martyr holding up uncommon faith. And tonight's bookends, we see the work of God, his assignment, and the heart of unity that holds up that uncommon intimacy. But you've got to be even willing. You've got to be even willing to, to get into the game with God. You've got to be willing to get up off that couch, to even get to the point to hear his voice, and then to say yes and open the door. So that's where we're at, church. Life is a series of bookends. It's a series of cycles. It's a series of chapters. But God's desire and his command it's not even just a desire, but his expectation is that we fulfill each one, that they are fulfilled. Say unto our chippus, fulfill the ministry which thou hast been given. I'm saying the same thing to you. Whatever ministry it is, whether it's family, here in the church, in your work, whatever it is, fulfill it. Don't give up. Do it within the chapter that God has given you, within the book that he's placed in front of you. Where are you in your assignment with the church where are you in assignment as a believer? And where are you in assignment as an individual? What area is God convicting you in tonight? Because I know he's convicting me. An uncommon integrity, an uncommon faith, an uncommon intimacy equals uncommon faithfulness. And let me tell you, there's much more. This is just scratching the surface. This is just a little bit. But if you get into the Bible, he's going to teach us how to be uncommon so we can be Proverbs 20, verse 6. Most men proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. This is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to come together with one heart, one mind, as one church, to fulfill the assignment that God has given to us here in Blue Springs. The question is, church, what are we going to do? Are we going to hear his voice? Are we going to get up? Are we, going to, are we going to answer the door? Are we going to say yes to God? You know, pastor has been talking about um, every, people coming down and, and putting their commitments in here, right? And that's good because we ought to. Some of us can't go, so we ought to give so others can go. Amen? And all of us should be praying about that. We should come down here and put the card in the box and make a commitment. But you can't be done that way. You have to be willing to come down here, get on your knees, and make a commitment of your life. Because if you're just committing your money, great, God will use it. But you're missing out on the moment. You're missing out on that moment that God has for you for intimacy. And once that moment is gone, it may never come back. Yeah, he'll give you another one, but this one's missed. Right now, God is giving us, church, the opportunity to come forward, make a commitment to him in any assignment that he might give us, and make a difference here in Blue Springs and wherever it is God may take us. Amen? Let's all stand, please. I have no doubt in my mind that God is working in all of your hearts because I know he's working in mine. And whatever assignment it is, whether it's going to be here at First Bible, whether it's going to be back in Zambia, are you willing to just hear his voice and are you willing to open the door? That's my prayer for you tonight. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us, this conference. Lord, the bookends that we need in our life to hold up what you have for us. Lord, it's amazing. When I think about the entire book from one end of the cover, of, cover of one end of the cover on the other end of that Bible, Lord, that's ultimately what we need in our lives to hold us up. 
in the life of Jesus Christ. You have some expectations, Lord God. You have some standards. And I know in my life, Lord God, I've failed you in many ways. But Lord, your grace and mercy sustains us. We can get up, wipe, dust ourselves off, and we can get back in the race, get back in the game, and we can run after the prize that is set before us. But Lord, we have to know your voice. So I ask and pray, Father, that right now you would work in and through the hearts of First Bible Baptist Church. All the, even the visitors, the members, whoever might be here, maybe there's someone here that doesn't even know Jesus as their Savior, and they need to meet you at the cross. Tonight's the time to do it, Lord God. So Lord, I just ask and pray that you would do an amazing work in the life of everybody's heart here tonight. Convict us, and not only convict us, but show us what we need to do. And maybe some people might be able to come forward and just commit their life to you as you've been asking them. We love you and praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a time.